There we go. So welcome to the fourth session of the fourth year uh, small group learning. Uh, we'll just go through the agenda quick, but today really what we'd like to do is provide you with um, some ideas around planning, but then open it up again for questions. Uh, we're finding that's really effective uh, in that we're providing some context and some ideas and then allowing for some discussion. If you stay, great. If you've gotten enough out of the session that you need, then uh, again, you can uh, log off. But uh, hopefully today we'll provide you with a little bit more of a plan that you're able to go forward with and some planning materials that'll help you on that journey. So on the next slide, we have um, just the quick agenda. So we will put together, uh, we'll be talking a little bit about putting together the structure of your course thinking about how lessons can help uh, and discuss quickly a little bit around transitioning fieldwork to an online environment, accessing uh, the library and its resources, uh, but more so Mark's got some great uh, examples of uh, things that you that might be helpful as you begin to put these lessons together. So on the, the next slide there, as you'll see, we're at the end of our, our roadmap. So we've gone over really high level understanding of course design. We did a lot of idea generation when we had Danny here to talk about his course with uh, tips and tricks, together with uh, formulating our own plans last week with a few more uh, types of engaging activities that could be done with uh, students. And then today we're really going to focus in on how to kind of solidify that approach and where to get started and well, everybody's kind of started. You have your courses, but I guess it's more the sense of how do we transition that all into an online environment in a way that's going to be um, helpful and uh, as well uh, conducive to planning over the summer and in through the fall. So on the next slide, we have uh, something that I just kind of pulled together in, in thinking about different frameworks of course design and as well as the discussions that we've had here. So we we're thinking it obviously you know you might be taking July off to have some vacation which I highly recommend um, but you know if you're thinking about what are the steps in that planning cycle you might have to speed them up or you know spread them out however it works for you but what we have been talking about in that first step is this idea of understanding your learners so in terms of really creating your own course design map and your timelines uh, thinking about really reflecting on um, what, what you know about your le learners, as well is if you're able to, the timetable will be coming out soon, the students will be uh, put into the system. Uh, once you have access to that, you could always send them an email that speaks to um, a survey to get some of their feedback about what they'd like to get out of a fourth year course. And I know that this is actually happening in some really large courses. So that's just that way to really begin to make some of that connection with your students who you might be having in that fourth year class. So understanding your learner is really that first step. And even if it is something that you're able to do on your vacation, it's just kind of thinking about what, what that looks like so that you're able to come back and be ready to uh, create those courses is, is a great first step. The second step is around overarching course framework, your course outline and reaching out to CPI. My high, high level suggestion here is do that in July because August is going to get a little busy and we don't want you lost in the queue. You won't get lost in the queue, I should say that, but it might take a, a little bit more time to get back because we know that August will be busy. Uh, so then moving into August, uh, one of the uh, key uh, key ideas that we've been talking about with faculty is if you can, you have your, your course uh, Sakai site is ready, it's not ready, fully ready to go, but if you're able to put your course outline up, you're able to put in a little bit of an intro of who you are, maybe you send an email to the students to say, hey, go and check out the course outline, get familiar with Sakai, that's going to allow them that kind of month to really understand, is this the right course for me, number one, uh, in the way that it's going to be delivered, but also allows them to really know what they're getting into for September and start their planning early as opposed to just being like, okay, start in September and they're overwhelmed with five courses. At least with yours, they can really get, get going and, and thinking about their planning. Uh, here as well, uh, a key piece is linking with the library to get all your readings, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. And then for, for us, what 
a lot of people have said, well, do I need to create everything and have it ready to go September one? And no, I, I don't think you do. And the the re one of the reasons for that is that's a lot of work. It's a lot of video PowerPoint things to be doing. But also, I don't. I think that you're able to do a little bit of reflection and saying, okay, you know, are the 15 minute videos being watched in this class, or are they engaging in the forums that I set are optional? Are they, how are they doing on the quizzes? So you'll be able to really think about uh, laying out maybe your first four lessons. So September isn't too much of a, a, a push, having that ready to go, but at least you have the framework. You have the skeleton of what your lessons are supposed to look like, and then you can just stop, start dropping in the information. And in October, it provides you with that opportunity to ask for some formative feedback from your students and maybe make a few little tweaks in through November and December to, uh, to align with uh, what they're saying about their experience with your, your course to date. So that's just sort of a, a bit of a roadmap kind of framework that we're hoping will help you help guide some of your course development. And again, not overwhelm you in thinking that you have to have everything ready to go for September, but that if you have some things ready to go you have a framework you know your learners you're inserting content as it comes you're reflecting maybe making it a bit better then that's really a, a really nice kind of course design map and timeline if uh, if i could add for uh step five the the october uh formative uh evaluation opportunity we've been sampling um a few potential technical uh solutions uh, throughout our, our sessions uh, th uh this june uh, and you've, uh, as members of the workshop, certainly have experienced them. Uh, something we can talk about maybe a bit more specifically as far as uh, application for uh, formative evaluation of, uh, of your teaching uh, and uh, methods of sharing it out to your students uh, afterwards, or if you'd like to reach out to, uh, to the CPI team. Um, but there, there certainly are some good and very streamlined options for that. Absolutely, thanks. So on the next slide here, we have a little bit of a thought from Maureen Connolly. So did you want to jump in here, Mark, on this one? Um, so the, uh, I think it's interesting. So, so to frame the challenge, uh, mapping out uh, a course uh, can sometimes be, be a bit challenging because naturally a course uh, tends to become more complex and more in-depth um, as it progresses. Uh, and typically one or an instructor would begin with introducing the uh, the course's principal content. Oh, got slides bouncing back and forth on myself here. OK, um, all right. Uh, so the, cor the course's uh, principal content has been um, uh, established at the beginning of the course. Typically, it's it's introductory in nature and students are given an opportunity to get a sense of it with uh, materials that don't quite require uh, in-depth application. Um, or a discussion just yet, uh, because again, it's introductory. Uh, but as time goes on, uh, naturally content does become uh, slightly more complex. Uh, and in slides, as we move forward, we'll see that um, courses can be mapped in terms of weeks, um, but the distribution of activities on a per week basis might change based on the complexity of content. Uh, so that that's what Maureen has been uh, addressing here at some level that uh, it, it a course delivery is shaped a, a, as a sort of arc because uh, it begins simply uh, and approachably, but as time goes on, um, the uh, the curve of the work or the curve of the of the complexity of the content can change, uh, and that's that's actually mapped out on the next slide I think quite well with a diagram we've brought in. Uh, is there something you'd like to add about that, Madeline? No, I, I think that makes sense. And I think the what you just said around, uh, you know, that first week, maybe there isn't a forum because they're just trying to digest what is the, the core concepts that my prof needs me to know. And so there's more readings possibly in that week, whereas the following week, maybe instead of three readings, you have two and they have a forum discussion. So in thinking about, you know, the complexity of the topic, but as well as the learning outcomes you want them to get. So the first week, again, might be just understand but the next two or three weeks is evaluate or critically synthesize. And so the assignments uh, become part of that or a higher level uh, engaging activities. Um, and uh, to expand upon that a little bit, uh, it, and we, we do as much as possible in an online environment, uh, encourage 
uh, making content at some level uh, reliable and predictable on the student side because th there's a little bit less uh, of you to to be there for your students um, as they're undertaking those um, those weekly or monthly uh, learning activities for your course. Uh, so that challenge is baked in a little bit with uh, the acknowledgement that the course can form a bit of an arc and one week, uh, particularly as a course proceeds, may not look exactly as uh, as the previous week might, especially when one compares uh, the, the last weeks to the, the first ones. <clears throat> OK. Uh, so this was uh, the diagram that I referred to uh, at some level that that might I, I think also demonstrate that that arc like uh, nature of, of a course's planning. Uh, we'll see that by the time we arrive at topic five, there's um, a great deal of, of, of content uh, as that pyramid uh, starts to, to heighten more and more. Uh, I'll also give you a moment just to uh, just to read those annotations. It's quite a bit of text on that page. Um, and again, to drill down a little bit more on the um, the, the white boxes as they were, um, they, they're all annotated with the word topic within them. Uh, that's merely the opportunity to introduce uh, the, the the course's principal content. Uh, again, topic one presumably occurring within those first weeks would um, not necessitate a great deal of depth just yet or, or, or application. Uh, but as um, uh, as the course progresses, the uh, the tint of gray uh, deepens further and further uh, as as course complexity increases, as um, assignment complexity uh, and demands upon your students increase as well. Um, and not only is that maybe represented with a little bit more real estate on this graph, um, but as well more time uh, distribution in terms of of a course's plan, uh, and whether that might be actual time. Um, within the uh, within the occurrence of the course in a term or uh, your arrangement of the way that students are planning their resources in, in, in terms of the course's delivery. So if there is uh, a particular week, for example, that is calling for students to submit uh, a, a very highly weighted um, uh, assignment, it may be useful to reduce the amount of other content in that week or perhaps even the week preceding that so that students are able to focus upon that that ever critical uh, moment within the course. Okay. Um, so we talked a little bit about mapping out or, or structuring out a course. Uh, this is uh, a snippet from something that the uh, the University of uh, Saskatchewan uh, uh, tends to recommend and use for some of the instructors that they work with. And this is the Teaching and Learning Center uh, uh, in, in in that particular institution. Uh, and this is actually a, an ex Excel document that has been uh, stylized quite a bit to have uh, to color and to have meaning, I think, uh, for us to to look at it and get it, I think, quickly a sense. Uh, Thankfully, it's it being an Excel document, uh, any of us are able to create that uh, not only on our side, but to customize it in a way that makes sense to us uh, as instructors and builders of these courses. Uh, so we'll, we'll note that uh, one row in this case, and we've not yet, there's simply, we didn't want this slide to become too large, but uh, each row could represent uh, a different module or a different week uh, or, dif or a different topic and so forth. Uh, and uh, presumably as the modules progress, we'll see more and more content occurring within these cells. Uh, so for example, the learning objectives may, uh, may be slightly increased in the first uh, module, but uh, the, uh, the required readings and the, the activities and evaluation, though I note here that final exam is, is, uh, is, is established as the evaluation of the first module. I think probably that's a bit reflexive. Uh, but presumably the, the number of evaluations, the number of activities is going to increase uh, as we increase in number of modules. Is there anything you'd like to add to this, Madeline, before I proceed? No, I think it, this can be helpful, I think, for professors as you're kind of going through, because I, I have my course outline and I know I go kind of week by week and what they have to do and their due dates. So some similar to this, but now I'm trying to just take that and put it in like 
formulate that into the lessons in Sakai. And that's really how I'm kind of dividing up the tasks. Um, but also, I think it's helpful for students and, and having that kind of visual. So on the next slide is also um, a, a course uh, framework that we found. And this one is um, a little bit more visual. And I was I was thinking about these from a student's perspective, because I know a lot of students will be like, OK, I'm just going to I'd love to just print this out. They put it up on their board. So it's kind of like a visual thing for them in their room. Um, some of them might not print it out, but like it, at least they have it right. Some of them make it screensavers on their like phones. Um, but with this, it's more of, OK, what do I need to do first week? And you can really kind of look quickly and see, OK, what is it that we're going to be doing this week? And similar to what Mark said is it kind of builds. And then in week four here, it kind of slows down, but then it builds again in terms of assessments. So it's also a nice way for us to see as instructors, OK, am I heavy loading? And I've done this a ton is like in November. It's like everything's due in November. Instead, how can I kind of change the way in which I deliver lectures and my quizzes to help to you know divide it up potentially across the semester so they don't feel so overloaded in one area? So something like this might take a little bit more you know, finesse with making the boxes and using a different type of software. but. There are different things out there that are useful to uh, create something like this that could be a nice visual for uh, students. I think the other piece that's nice about this is, um, and it could just be added right into your course outline, right? As kind of like the last page, is it also aligns to um, universal design principles. So people that maybe are more visual and really want to see something one page and it's right there in front of them, as opposed to reading a ton of text to really grasp what is the most important things for that week. So again, just another idea of how you can create something like this that allows you to say, okay, this is what I'm going to do for the whole semester. And maybe you only get up to week two in terms of all of the creation of the modules and the, and your PowerPoint voiceovers and all the material, but at least you know where you're going and you have that, that map, and then you can start inserting things. On the next slide. So this is also uh, kind of seen as that idea of like the bird's eye view. So if you have a framework, something like this set out, you want to look at it and really reflect back and think about what's going on in this and tell your students about it. So if you built a framework, you know, tell them in a video, just say, hey, this is the, the map that I created. This is what I'm thinking. This is how I'm creating it. And we had talked about this, I think in this session, maybe it was another one, about uh, telling your students why you're creating the course in the way that you are. And that just allows them to really reflect and really kind of bring it in a little bit closer to themselves to say, okay, that's why I'm doing Doing what I'm doing as opposed to I'm not just doing it to get a mark I know they all are about marks but uh, at the same time uh, a lot of them want to know okay well why are we doing this assignment and where why does that land here in the semester as opposed to over there so having a that allows them to also feel a little bit more empowered and understanding of where they're going with their course it allows you as well to uh, ask yourself some questions about the learning outcomes so you set up the learning outcomes for your course does the assessment actually match the learning outcomes that I have? And so you can see that across that, that map and also saying, okay, are the activities balanced? So does one unit require, um, it, it doesn't really have as much um, for the students to do, or maybe it has too much. So you're able to kind of say, okay, these readings, I wanna make sure that it's consistent, that not one week they're going to have to read for an entire day and another week they only have like really short readings. Making it consistent is also that piece of predictability that we're, we want to infuse into our design so that students know in their own time uh, management uh, systems how much time they're going to need to allocate to your course to do those readings and to, to engage. So making sure it's balanced and, and achieving those learning outcomes, it can be sort of seen when you create that type of, um, of a framework. And Mark, you have a, a cool downloadable one here. Yeah, yeah, um, and I, I'm unsure of the uh, the value of following it. Uh, I'll risk it, and perhaps, yeah, okay. So it's it's opening on my other screen, yeah, which, um, so actually, I rather than uh, break our share and then have that whiplash of 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 me kind of rushing to meet up where we were, um, I, I do invite everyone to click upon and follow that first link, the another downloadable blueprint link. Uh, and then I'll also point out that on the page that appears for you, 
Uh, there is roughly in the center uh, an option called downloadable version of the course blueprint and audit template that'll appear on your system as an Excel document. Uh, there's quite a bit to it. I've, I've used that um, actually for my own purposes before and have found that I used earnestly about 60% of uh, what was being presented to me within that sheet uh, and, and found it to be quite robust in that regard. But uh, I, it, it's, it's a handy tabular spreadsheet that allows for um, all of those advantages that Madeline has described in particular, visualizing the entirety of the course, understanding if there's a preponderance of stuff happening in one week versus another. Um, are you constructively aligning uh, not only on a course basis, but on a week base uh, or on a, a unit basis, uh, the, the outcomes with the activities? Uh, so th this, this can be very handy. Uh, and as well, it's something that's, that's highly customizable for you, but um, to, to kind of transition to the ease with which this can be expressed to students, uh, it maybe doesn't have to be a, um, a, a, a well or a, a a fancily developed uh, graphical document, but can simply be passed on to your students in tabular format, or, or as Madeline has described, can be something that uh, you can take advantage of uh, our uh, video creation technologies that are, are now, I think, more easily available than they've been uh, to express this to your students in, uh, in a very brief two or three minute introduction that helps them perhaps understand the structure that you're envisioning uh, for their journey throughout the course. And I just downloaded it. I don't know if anybody has right now. I, I had done it earlier, but I didn't see that there was tabs along the bottom, which is really interesting yep. because there's a uh, you uh, program objectives. If you have those, you know, it's always fun to put those in. But really, you're looking at the course objectives is a tab and then it has lessons outlined. Then it also has a tab for action verbs for objectives. So if you're thinking about, you know, what's my objective for that actual lesson? Uh, it gives you all of the different kind of blooms taxonomy type questions. Um, uh, action verbs that you can use, and it's just a nice quick reference. I like that. Right. Um, and to, uh, I, I suppose, frame this in terms of uh, a, a fourth year course discussion um, that, that we, we've been having this past month um, that we're so thankful that you've uh, continuously um, attended. Uh, action verbs uh, within that third tab that are a, a bit off to the right might be more appropriate for uh, the course that you have in mind for uh, your uh, senior year students. Absolutely. Okay. Great. Um, so we, we've talked quite a bit ab about the lessons tool throughout this session. And uh, if you've been kind enough to attend other sessions, uh, in particular, the the lessons tool discussions that uh, uh, Matt Claire and I have been offering uh, throughout this month, uh, you've, you've heard quite a bit about it. Uh, and as well, you've um, probably heard that uh, lessons can be not only a method of availing all the technical components of a course to your students, but can be a way of demonstrating the structure of your course in a digitized format. Um, so one of the things, of course, that we're coping with is the loss of our opportunity to be in a classroom with students. Uh, we're no longer able to um, to sit next to them or or, um, or, or to proverbially kind of be uh, elbow buddies um, while students are determining their path through the course. There may need to be other methods of helping students navigate um, online modules or online constructions uh, can be very helpful in that regard. And that's where lessons comes in, coupled with uh, something that has been uh, intentionally designed within uh, the spreadsheets that we've described in these past few slides, for example. Uh, a lot of this, I th uh, a lot that, that is within those slides can be easily translated into content in a lessons tool. Uh, and as well, lessons can be uh, in its ability to avail students with all of the different technologies that, uh, that are around. So um, a link to a resource that you shared on the internet or reading a link to a video embed or um, or to something that's available within the Brock library that we're actually going to talk about a little bit towards the end of our session today if uh, if there's uh, both time and energy and and, and will uh, from all of our attendees. Uh, so we're going to take uh, I think a last meaningful look at uh, the example course that uh, that Madeline has uh, made available to us and as well and I think more by popular demand, uh, we've recently created a template that might be of some value to you. 
uh, to download. So I, uh, I definitely invite you to, uh, to to stay and be attentive about uh, about your options in that regard. Uh, and I'll also want to frame uh, exactly how to use that kind of content for you. Oops. That wasn't a white slide when we used it last. <laughs> I might be having some connectivity challenges here. Just going to try resharing this slide to see if um, maybe it, just requeuing it would be all that's needed. There we are. Okay. I'm I'm unsure what that was, but uh, thanks for your patience, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, as I mentioned, the lessons tool, and in fact, I think maybe what, what we will do is uh, take a peek once again at lessons for those that uh, haven't been um, having the opportunity uh, to attend uh, those other workshops. Uh, this might really be the only time, second time that you've, you, you've, you've heard about it. Uh, so I'm going to share an example on, uh-oh. Okay. Yeah, I'm having a little uh, issue on the, the download here too, I'll be honest. Hmm. Okay. Go figure. Oh, I got the, uh, how, how can I use it? The, how to down, how do I import lessons content I got? Okay. Um, I wonder if uh, any of our brave souls today wouldn't mind uh, unmuting themselves to confirm that uh, they're able to hear us. Okay, I can see Donna's been successful at, uh, at accessing the link. Okay, great, thank you. Oh, all right, we, so we might be back. The, uh, the joys of online synchronous delivery, I suppose. <laughs> um, uh, I'm, I'm getting to that, Donna, <laughs> but thank you for asking. Um, so I, I think maybe before we, we jump too much into the toggles and the nuts and bolts and all of that stuff, uh, I, I do actually desire to frame um, what exactly this is uh, so that you, you know what to expect. Um, and though there's an image right there, I think it would be more useful to see it in action. Uh, so I'm, I am going to share something that's available on the other monitor, which means that you'll temporarily lose access to this link. And I'm going to move uh, the presentation off the screen. Uh, okay, so, oops. Uh, I've created a Sakai lessons template space. Uh, that is, um, this is something that, that uh, actually I've been able to export and make available online to any that click upon that link that's within our, within our slides. Uh, it uses, uh, I'm surprised this was retitled. Fix that. So it uses a version of the lessons tool that we've enabled within a Sakai site. Uh, lessons like so many of the other tools within Sakai, the gradebook, the assignments tool, uh, tests and quizzes and so forth, is not present by default, uh, mainly because Sakai's desire is not to inundate you with all of its various options, but to um, allow you to, to kind of start and design a course based on your own attentions. Uh, so we've enabled the lessons tool. Uh, I've uh, populated it with, with quite a bit of, of content that uh, is, is really only template in nature. Uh, and so when a student or when you click upon this lessons area here, we're greeted by uh, what's well, basically a table of contents. And these are a series of sub pages, one for each week of the course. Uh, naturally, I've, I've not uh, progressed beyond week six. Um, that's something that I'm happy to assist with, with those that would like to uh, perhaps expand this, uh, this structure when they brought it into their own Sakai site. Uh, so when I click upon week one, I'm greeted with um, quite a bit of Cicerone in Latin, which is just, uh, it's, a, it's a placeholder text. Uh, is uh, editable upon clicking the, uh, the little pencil over paper icon uh, and as well is intended to be uh, an introductory description of what students ought to expect for that particular week. Uh, although as the course instructor, it might be worthwhile to consider exactly what students should be greeted with when they uh, arrive at the, the top page, at the top of the page for that weekly lesson. Oops. So 
So in this case, I've added a little bit of additional text, which we see appear here. Uh, learning outcomes are also provided within this template. Uh, they're not filled in because they're naturally quite course specific. And as well, a checklist uh, uh, included a suggested uh, primary outcome within the checklist. Uh, and this is uh, an option for students to on their side as they're perusing your online modules that you've created um, to check off that they've completed that. Uh, not only is this an indication to them that they've uh, undertaken the, the breadth of the week's tasks, but also provides for a little bit of structure uh, that you've prescribed at some level that ought to be the order of their weekly work. Uh, again, there's quite a bit of text on this page, but not a great deal of, uh, of, of media just yet. Uh, I've prescribed a videos area, which uh, would be a useful place to embed either a video that you've created and uploaded uh, with some of our technologies here at Brock. Uh, and when I say uploaded, added to a private space like uh, Echo 360 that we've discussed uh, somewhat, uh, and a space also for readings to be linked. That can be content that's available from the Brock Library. Uh, it could be uh, content available outside on the web entirely, in which case uh, it would be a great idea to provide a, a web link to those locations. And then as well, a space for the various types of assessment or learning activities that are connected with uh, this particular week. Uh, we've added spaces for all of the different types, uh, and I shouldn't say all, all of the different types, but several different types, uh, in particular those that are easily embeddable from your from a Sakai site into the lessons tool that's also living in that Sakai site. So it streamlines that experience a little bit from your student or for your students. Uh, so we'll link for a weekly quiz, something in the assignments tool, and as well something that is from the forums tool. Uh, if we desire not to have uh, a discussion component for the week, uh, if, if the week, for example, is uh, if, if the content isn't appropriate to it, clicking the, the garbage can icon and then confirming, and we'll see that that's all gone. Uh, and that garbage can icon will remove any of the other content that uh, lands on your page. At, um, and, and that, of course, is post the, uh, the import that is can be done. Um, just checking to see if there have been any. There's one one comment. Uh, would it be of use to add a section for questions raised by students and answers provided? Um, absolutely. I guess you could do that within a lesson. It would mean you have to have somewhere for them to go to do that. So I think probably using the forums is a good place to be uh, in sense of like week one, questions that students have and then you go in as the professor or the TAs go in and they answer those questions because most likely if one student has it uh, lots would so you could definitely link that in straight from here into one of the forums. Absolutely uh, and in fact I think we've both uh, seen that uh, used quite to, to, to quite good effect and you've done that in your course uh, a number of times if I'm not mistaken Madeline. Yeah. <laughs> okay uh, thank you for the question. OK, um, so I'll reshare that slide now that uh, that we've got, I, I think, probably a very, very brief sense of. Uh, of what can be expected uh, and pardon me as I fly up to the point that we were at. Uh, so this uh, uh, Donna, you asked uh, uh, several moments ago about um, what exactly this file extension is um, and uh, it's a it's a customized sort of extension that uh, the Sakai lessons tool is looking for. Uh, it's not really interactable with any other kind of software. Uh, and some, um, yeah, awesome, okay. So well, how that, do we install uh, that? Because that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, um, so, so rather than uh, me bumbling over my words and, and trying to demonstrate it across multiple monitors and probably screwing it up, uh, there are some steps available at that second link, uh, the how can I use it link. Uh, and that that's a, a link to some community documentation that uh, I've felt has been quite clear uh, and is very, very task oriented uh, and hopefully should be of some assistance to you as well. Uh, just as a reminder, the, the EdTech team is really happy to assist with this if uh, if you'd like to. Thanks, Madeline. Uh, if if you'd like to reach out to us with um, some questions about um, exactly how does that go and, and what am I doing? Uh, the 
the other option here is actually how to download the style sheet. Um, so if if you've you've not kind of tinkered with uh, with with web development and HTML and all of those other exciting things in the past, uh, a style sheet is a set of rules that will govern uh, your lessons tool and will tell it to do neat things like uh, provide a red banner around your your lesson headings and um, in particular the the top ones and for the the lower headings uh, like in this in this example here the the learning outcomes or the videos and the readings uh, in the the image to the left of the page. Uh, provide a gray background as an indication to students that there is there is a page hierarchy or structure in place uh, that that colorfulness and and fanciness is not something that the lessons tool will do uh, by defaults uh, the we've actually added that as a customization so uh, there's also a style sheet uh, and that's really just a set of rules uh, that is available with the link to the right of the page and it is uh, embeddable to you, uh, or it is something that, uh, as well as manually downloading it, you'll want to manually attach it. Uh, we'll help you with that, but separately. And if, if there's time, I, I think at the end of our discussion, uh, I'd, I'd be very happy to, to demonstrate that process. Uh, but I, I, I don't want to take us back into the, uh, into the nuts and bolts just quite yet. So basically with that, um, and I know my team kind of laughs at me, but I'm like, I want to make it pretty and I want to make it look professional and not just have a lot of black text on white and, and just have something that just makes it look a little bit different. So um, with that, definitely just get in touch with uh, EdTech and they'll be able to help you figure that out. Uh, and and if you're especially adventurous, we can even help you add additional customization. If, uh, if, if red's not your thing and you prefer a different color, certainly we can assist with that. Um, and the, the sky can be the limit with these style sheets. Um, it's, it's really your, your up, uh, appetite for, uh, for risk. <laughs> um, so, uh, let me see. So, so actually that was, uh, and, and I didn't anticipate this would arrive so quickly. Uh, that more or less concludes our lessons discussion. And, uh, as I said, I, I'll want us to perhaps revisit that with, um, with the will and, and the energy at the end of our session, we've got uh, roughly 10 minutes left of, of what uh, Madeline and I, I think regard as discussion time. Uh, and then afterwards, we'll um, perhaps have an opportunity to explore a bit more deeply um, some of uh, some of the questions that have come up today. Um, as well, throughout this month, we've uh, we've uh, done our best to uh, address and explore some of the, the questions and concerns that were expressed uh, during the week one survey. Uh, if uh, so, those that were in attendance that week, uh, you might recall that we shared uh, a technology called an Etherpad uh, and asked a series of questions. Uh, and many of you were kind enough to offer um, significantly in-depth thoughts. Uh, and we've, um, as I said, we've done our darndest to uh, to address those or explore those as as the month has gone by. Uh, there are, in this case, some I, I think lingering questions that we we've not yet had the opportunity to address either because it didn't quite fit in with the discussion um, or we just ran out of time. Uh, so these are two of them. And uh, I, I think in particular the uh, the upper left uh, discussion is uh, is an interesting challenge to frame and is something that is both being actively explored uh, and may as well benefit from a little bit of reframing. Uh, Madeline and I were discussing uh, opportunities for this in the in the previous days, and uh, one thought that has arisen uh, that may not specifically address the the practical nature on a student's side of being in a lab and and uh, or, or or I should say not just being in a lab, but um, be uh, undertaking field work, which is highly practical and, and is very application and experience driven. Um, but giving students an opportunity with um, video that integrates uh, questions throughout, uh, so interstitial questions uh, that can be assessed or not, um, or, or really are just for the benefit of students ensuring that they're keeping up, uh, can be very helpful. Uh, Brock has a couple of very useful video options, uh, uh, I, I guess, availed to us as of late, uh, or rather that is becoming um, increasingly conspicuous to us as of late, that can be useful for this, in particular Stream, uh, which is uh, a Brock community product. It's provided within our Microsoft 360 uh, environment that we we're all able to see when we we log into Brock to to check our email. Um, 
it's a place to upload video and as well a place where video can have uh, questions inserted. Uh, so one excellent example uh, that is available, I think at the moment for much of Brock to watch, uh, is a, a, a first year chemistry course uh, in which students are actually asked questions uh, in advance of what an instructor is is about to to undertake uh, for the uh, for the lab work that's happening. Uh, so again, very very applications driven and allows students to perhaps get ahead of content to be reflective about it. Um, and to um, feel that they're actively uh, undertaking or learning that content in a, in a way that perhaps might only have been passive with uh, simply instructional video that plays for a number of minutes and then concludes. Is there something that, uh, that you'd like to add there, Madeline? Yeah, I'm just as well with anything related to field work or experiential education. Uh, we do ask that you reach out to your ECs, your experiential education coordinators, because they have been coming up with lots of different ideas. They've created a bit of a, a guide um, on their web page that has different types of resources. So that's definitely a place to go. And now switching over to the library piece, Mark, you want to talk just quickly about that one? Mm hmm. I'm. Um grabbing very quickly the link to the um, the experiential ed um, oh, yeah. site uh, within the Brock environment. That is a useful jump point uh, for any that want to uh, contact their uh, their faculty's EE coordinator. Um, and uh, definitely encourage that you do that. Uh, as Madeline said, they're creating some excellent content. Uh, so there, there was Um, oh, I see. OK, sorry about that. Just had a bit of a connection drop there. And I'm waiting for my screen to my, my display to regenerate for me. OK, <laughs> um, so that there is there was also some early concern around uh, what is research going to look like now that students don't have physical access to the Brock Library? Uh, and certainly that's a concern. Research is changing now, uh, or, or I should say, it, it, w whether whether folks wanted it to within uh, higher ed, it seems to have changed at least temporarily. Uh, students have lost the opportunity to to peruse bookshelves, uh, and as well any other sorts of physical collections, uh, and to uh, uh, to attend a reference desk and to ask questions uh, in a in a traditional format. Uh, but there are lots of opportunities made available through the Brock Library, uh, even certainly before uh, the the pandemic uh, became uh, part of our immediate context. Uh, virtual reference has been uh, an opportunity available to to Brock students and and to the Brock community, uh, and that that's absolutely something that I believe is worth exploring uh, with your. Uh, with your librarian and uh, is something that is worth passing students to as well, should they have any research questions. Um, as I'm speaking, I'm searching out a link that I think will be useful to folks. As well around the library, I do, I do know that they have been uh, working on a strategy for loaning um, and they were just figuring out infection control kind of procedures around that. So that's a, another thing. The other piece is uh, if you have all of your readings already created, I'm probably going to, you were going to talk about this, Mark, but I'll throw it out there, is uh, if you have those already aligned into your course outline, you can send those into the library. They will source the links and then put those right back into your Sakai site. This is something that we really need to be vigilant around uh, in terms of copyright and intellectual property and those kind of things. It is very tempting to just download the articles when you get access and then just throw them right into your Sakai, which I think I might have done at one point. Um, and we have to be vigilant in not doing that because of the, the importance around copyright. So uh, they have a great service. They do it kind of for you and the, the links get uh, automatically put into your site. Right. Um, so I, I as Madeline noted, there is uh, a tool within Sakai that can be enabled and provide students with a link to um, the prescribed course readings. Uh, also, as she noted, uh, it's worthwhile reaching out to uh, the the email that I've uh, provided within this meetings chat uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, 
the uh, and, and I've worked with um, the, the the reserves folks uh, at, in particular during their their um, their busy times. There's a lot going on, and it, it it comes quite quickly to them. So the the earlier that you reach out to them, I, I believe that the more time that they'll have to um, to offer your your course and your readings list the attention it deserves. Uh, so strongly encourage that. Um, there is uh, also a liaison librarian assigned to uh, e each subject area that uh, at some point I'm sure you've communicated with. Uh, those liaison librarians are also available to support you, the, the research done by your students. And in fact, um, any new or freshly created Sakai sites, and this has been in place for some time, it's, it's, it's not a new opportunity, will have um, a library research option enabled by default that when it's working properly will uh, immediately uh, connect you and your students to the subject guide for the uh, the subject uh, that your course uh, exists for them so uh, that that link is something that i more than ever would encourage uh, you allow to exist within your sakai site uh, after its creation Awesome, thanks. And I guess the next slide is just related to a number of links that uh, we've put in here. We'll again put those on the main site where we'll put this recording together with the links. Uh, generally good stuff right there is of course our flexible teaching and learning uh, page and links to all the special interest and workshop sessions. Um, so just to really kind of wrap this up and open it up for the last 10 minutes of, of questions is uh, the next slide being um, just where we've got to, right, is uh, the, our path traveled together here in these four sessions is uh, we have been able to look at, you know, overview, we've done some idea generation, formulated some plans related to assessments and different uh, capabilities within Sakai, and then solidifying this approach and thinking about where and how do you plan moving forward. So on the next slide is um, some of those general principles really that we want to make sure that you continue to consider. We talked about these in the first few weeks around uh, your design. So if you can always come back to this idea of saying, okay, how do I make sure that the way in which I create my course is predictable for students? Uh, however, as we said today, you know, builds, there might be something a little bit different each week, but you know, there's that predictability in terms of the amount of time and what to expect and even the design. And I think that's important uh, in what we were talking about. It's not just to make it pretty, but it's a predictable design so that the students know how to flow through the material. How are you allowing these students to be connected together in, um, you know, if it's in a forum, if it's in uh, group settings on Microsoft Teams, whatever that might look like, how do we make sure we continue to be, uh, allow them to be connected? Ensure there's that flexibility. I can't stress enough the importance of the asynchronous approach. Uh, definitely important, as well as empowerment. So how can we allow these fourth year students to feel like they have a stake in the game here and saying, you know, how do they, um, you know, maybe create their own student pages? How do they actually uh, help to deliver some of the, the content through presentations and, and discussion forums? So empowering them to be part of the content generation and, and being part of that course. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to highlight quickly uh, what our plans are for the summer. Uh, over June, I think we will have done about, I think like 35 or 36 workshops uh, with approximately um, 600 faculty instructors uh, being engaged in all these, which is phenomenal, like probably the most engaged kind of uh, month we've seen in, in a long time. And rightfully so, because everybody's planning. But what we're going to focus in on for the rest of the summer are individual consults. Right now, while it's fresh in your mind, get in the door with CPI, clarify some of the things that you would like to have clarified, and you should be really nicely set up for the summer. Uh, we'll also continue to have some of our Sakai and assessment workshops, which are always in high demand. So we'll continue to do those. We have TA uh, supports that are happening. They're called instructional support assistants. So there's going to be two per faculty who will be working with TAs to ensure your TAs are ready for the fall. We'll be asking faculty to fill out a survey to ask to basically say, what are the top three things you want your TAs to know for September? And then we'll help to create some resources and some planning and workshops for your TAs. 
Uh, and then the last two there, one is an async course in Sakai. So we're going to take some of this material and put it together in a kind of a leading practices async kind of course that you can access to, again, just kind of refresh as you're going through and designing your own courses. We'll also be doing some proactive re outreach, uh, maybe not so much to the people here because we know you got here and you've got some of this great information, um, but we will be looking at some of the high enrollment courses. So if you're teaching any of those, you might hear from us. We want to make sure you're set up for success, uh, especially with some of the little, uh, you know, technical pieces in behind the scenes that you want to make sure that you have done right. If you have a big class, that might be uh, one of the outreach or if there's um, other certain courses that we've we've heard that might be struggling and thinking about what does this look like in a in a asynchronous environment. So those are our plans for the summer. Uh, I think for for this group, the best thing to do is really to um, book an individual consult and see if and and get some of your big questions uh, worked through in the next little while so that you're uh, you're ready to go for the fall. So in just as an end there again. That's all we got. We're just reach out and uh, check out any of the events and any of the links that uh, we have on our CPI site. And with that, I know we talked a lot today. It's funny whenever I talk to Mark, I'm like, I don't know if we have enough slides, but then we always, you know, have lots. So if uh, anybody has any questions, I'll just stop the recording and uh, we can definitely answer those.